So John, first, just tell us about Bravery Angels um, from the top, because it's a really incredible project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, appreciate the opportunity to do so. So um, I'm national ambassador for an organization called Braver Angels. Braver Angels is America's largest grassroots bipartisan organization um, dedicated to the work of political depolarization. It's work that extends across sectors of American society. I mean, we have programs that run in Congress and every level of government, college campuses, um, uh, fledgling digital media network. We even have a singer-songwriter community, a couple hundred artists and musicians across the country using art and music and culture as a means of bringing people together. But we are principally located in, in communities. Uh, we're a membership organization, about twelve or 13,000 or so members, um, about 100 or so local Brave Rangers alliances. You can think of them as chapters. And uh, we do a wide range of things, but our work sort of begins in... Um, in um, uh, the application of principles of uh, family therapy um, in small workshops uh, that um, bring together folks from the left and the right, blues and reds, as we say in-house, reds and blues, uh, to not so much argue or debate politics, but to speak from the vantage point of their own personal experience in terms of why they see politics the way that they do. It's quite literally the application of marriage counseling to the relationship between Republicans and Democrats, right? Uh, which it probably feels fairly appropriate. Now, that's far from the only thing that we do, but that's where we started, was with this little workshop model. And from that has sprung a wide menu of methods and interventions, teaching people how to communicate empathetically, um, teaching people how to debate, discuss issues uh, in different contexts, giving people the opportunity to organize together directly in ways that create relationships and new norms for discourse that humanize each other across the divide. And people take those norms and those habits from our community back with them to their corporation, to their local government, to their college campus, to their kitchen table. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, through media work and so forth, we try and tell the story of what that building, what that movement of goodwill looks like in a way that makes people want to be a part of it. And so in a walloping nutshell, that's basically the idea of Braver Angels. I, that was a walloping nutshell, but I want more wallop. <laughs> there you go. Um, will you give us a, a couple sure. of examples of how a, um, a conversation might proceed uh, in one of the chapters? Yeah, sure. Well, so, yeah, I mean, depending on what you are, depending on what you've signed up for, I'll say a little bit more about the Red Blue uh, workshop. This was our very first sort of program. And uh, the way it begins is you've got about a half a dozen folks or so from each side. They come into, come into a shared space and uh, they go through a series of exercises, the first of which is a listing out of the stereotypes that each side uh, sees the other as having, as, having about, uh, as having about them. And so uh, Blues might say, might have a list that says something along the lines of, well, conservatives, Republicans, uh, they think that we hate America. They think that uh, we're uh, that we hate God. They think that uh, we want the state to run everybody's lives. That we mooch off the government. And when you ask the Reds to lift out the stereotypes people have about them, they almost invariably start with the observation that well, they think that we're racist, or they think that we hate women, or they think that maybe we hate poor people, or we hate science, you know, so on and so forth. And um, each side is asked to sort of. Uh, list out those stereotypes, explain why they think those stereotypes are inaccurate, but also each side is invited to reflect on the ways in which there might be a kernel of truth to, to some of the stereotypes or the others, right? And so it doesn't always happen this way, but often, you know, you'll have folks on the blue side who'll say something like, well, you know, the reason we, the reason we, we protest and so forth is not because we hate America, it's because we're trying to make America better and live up to what it could be, but maybe some of us have gotten so cynical about the American project that we, we talk as if we don't love America in some cases. And you'll have people on the right who will say things like, look, to be a conservative is not to be, is not to be racist. Conservatism is not racism, but that doesn't mean that you don't have some racists who vote Republican or make their way into our tent, and we should, we should, be, more, we should be more proactive about making sure that racism doesn't find a comfortable place in the Republican Party or in the conservative movement. And so we invite that sort of reflection and the, the, the workshop progresses through a series of exercises from there that culminate ultimately in direct conversations about why we believe what we believe, but that proceeds from this place of giving deep and rich context in terms of the personal experiences 
that lead to those beliefs to begin with. In our Brave Angels debate program, which is incredibly popular on college campuses, uh, we have a model for debate uh, innovated uh, by my colleague, uh, April Lawson, um, which is sort of a parliamentary approach to community debate, where you basically have a, a room full of folks, um, could be in a college campus, could be in a local community, um, you have a chairperson uh, in the middle, sort of moderating the conversation. Everybody gets to give up and give a speech within the time length. Uh, people are encouraged to marshal facts, but also personal experience in their arguments, and to be clear about what, not just why they think what, what, what they think, but also where they may be uncertain about their arguments. If I think that you know, a free market, you know, economy with zero regulation is the best way to achieve prosperity, but I've got a little bit of doubt or uncertainty about the consequences of wiping out the social safety net, I am encouraged to say that, mm -hmm. that, you know, I think that this is a good idea, but at the same time, I could be wrong about X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And people even have the opportunity to switch sides if they feel that they've heard something from the other side that actually is somewhat persuasive to them. And so there's an emphasis on intellectual humility and the communal pursuit of truth in this context. And so those are a couple of examples. That's great. Um, can you think of any time that, the, that people participating in, in, in one of these conversations, either in, in the debate or the uh, oh, town hall, did you say? No, what, what's, the, what's the first? The Brave Ra oh, so the, yeah, so the first one was the Red Blue Workshop. Red Blue Workshop. Second one I mentioned yeah. is the Brave Angels debate, but there are many more. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, where um, uh, you were surprised, maybe in the workshop, where, where people just brought in something that completely surprised you. Well, you know, um, it's hard to... It's hard to take me by surprise, I think. <laughs> I've, I've been in this sort of work for so long. So I come from uh, an interesting kind of family background. Um, years ago, I was, uh, I was a nominee for, for Congress uh, in Los Angeles. I actually ran against Maxine Waters in 2014, if you can believe that. It was like a lifetime ago. Um, but uh, so it's mostly left-leaning district, um, but people would ask me at the time, they would say, what at the age of 26 makes you qualified to represent a district like ours. And I would say, well, I come from an interesting family background. My mother's a liberal black Democrat from LA. My father's a conservative right Republican from Tennessee. I grew up explaining my father to my mother, my mother to my father, and that's why I can represent all of you. Right? <laughs> um, and so in the course of my life in politics, but also just sort of race and culture and society, I've, I've seen a lot of things. I think that what has maybe been surprising in some cases has been the quickness when the stars align with which folks who feel very polarized, very strident in a certain direction, uh, will actually find themselves uh, in deep sort of empathetic relationship with people who they wanted to sort of, you know, send, send to Siberia just sort of, sort of a moment before. We had a debate in Berkeley, um, and I forget what the, what the issue was, but there was an activist who happened to be a, a homeless trans individual who had let everybody know that he was going to be leading um, a protest against the debate prior to. And so the faculty at Berkeley uh, warned us uh, that, you know, this, this individual uh, um, was somebody who, you know, was, was known for leading rowdy protest and to just be aware of that. Maybe we should reschedule it or find some way to work around this. But instead, um, my colleague April and the team uh, reached out to this individual, made the, made the point that uh, we respected protest, that it was part of their right to protest, and we didn't have any problem with that at all, but that um, if they were interested, um, this individual and the people who were protesting alongside could come in and participate in the debate as well. They could come in and give a speech uh, stating why why they thought the debate itself was a bad idea if they mm -hmm. wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly what wound up happening. And mm -hmm. that individual apparently gave one of the most extraordinary speeches of the night and wound up being thoroughly embraced by everybody in the room, including the people who very much, you know, were opposed to that individual politically. And so that's the type of experience that comes comes out of these workshops. I'll, I'll just give you one more really quickly. Yeah, that's great. Uh, in one of our earliest workshops, um, uh, with the red blue, with the red blue workshop that I explained earlier, we had um, groups of uh, uh, Democrats and Republicans gathering uh, in a community center in South Lebanon, Ohio. This was an extended workshop in the early days. They were together for a couple of days or so. Um, in the early aftermath of the Trump Clinton 
election. This was right around the time we first got started. And there was a man there uh, who's an evangelical Christian, former sheriff and construction worker, a man named Greg, um, who was very much uncomfortable uh, with Islam. And it just so happened to be the case that on the other side, on the blue side, uh, there was a fellow uh, participating named Kuyar, who was a Persian immigrant and a leader of the local Democratic Central Committee or local Democratic uh, County Party. And at a certain point in the structured interaction portion of the workshop, Greg said something to Kuyar along the lines of, I need to tell you very quickly, uh, directly, uh, that I have a problem uh, with Islam, and I can spell it in four letters, I-S-I, -I, and before he could finish spelling the word ISIS, um, Kuyar interjected to say, my friend, I understand what you're saying. He said, but my religion has been hijacked by people who don't share my values. He said, I think something along the lines of, can you think about people in your religion who've hijacked your religion who don't share yours? And it didn't take Greg very long to think about people who have, you know, killed and, 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 and uh, dehumanized and committed violence in the name of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, right? Mm -hmm. And so they made a commitment to each other by the end of the workshop that they announced to all the people participating that not only would they continue to work together for political depolarization, but that Kuyar had agreed to come visit uh, a service at Greg's church and that Greg had agreed to come visit and participate in a service at Kuyar's mosque and that if they could do it, they'd bring their communities together in dialogue. And so they've been working together ever since. And so yeah. those sorts of stories have multiplied over the, over the larger arc of the story of braver angels i mean that's yeah those are our beautiful stories and like that and that seems like really important work um when i first heard that you addressed polarization um because this is the world we live in my like i don't know i uh my cortisol levels rose mm -hmm. because polarization is um it, you know has a certain history of being a, a, a word that uh, Republicans and conser the conservative movement has used to describe, um, uh, you know, all those who object to broadly to the very, very broad liberal consensus that I think probably most of us would sign on to, starting with a proposition like all humans are created equal. Um, and to say that there are these, that there are outliers who, um, you know, think that America is first and foremost a white nation or a Christian nation, or that Christian hierarchies should dictate uh, social organization in the US, or that it should be predicated on IQ or race, or that we should be you know, a full-fledged patriarchy instead of a hedged patriarchy, that we shouldn't just take our husband's names, but that we should play um, traditional roles in the household. I think it's pretty hard to find workaday Americans who object to the equality clause. Um, you do, you, you hear them, you hear them in podcasts, you hear people talking about IQs or, um, you know, other kind of, or even merit or fundamental qualities that make some people better than other people. But, um, when Buckley and the conservative movement decided that there was a really, um, significant group of people who objected, not just to like, whatever it was, whatever lattes were in the period, like, you know, whatever affectation of liberal, liberals were imagined to have. That they were, when, I, when you were talking about that workshop, I was thinking, uh, you know, some liberals might say they think we're snobs or they mm -hmm. think we're like just sure. avocados and lattes and all That's that stuff. That's definitely one. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and right, I mean, look around, come on. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Got a and, lot of lattes. Right. <laughs> And I, I mean, I just heard, a, 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 it was right after the um, invasion of Ukraine, uh, Vladimir Putin gave an address that I thought was incredibly interesting. And it was a list of things that he, that Russia would no longer stand for. Mm. Um, and they started with um, oysters and foie gras. So the lattes and, and avocados of uh, Europe, yeah. right? Like really expensive, showy, fancy food. Then right after that, it was gender freedom. So uh, you can imagine gender ideology or all the, the freedom to have trans uh, stuff. to eat guacamole is something I cherish as an American. Yeah, right. So you'd keep guac. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, what, it matters you, a lot to me. You, you and Putin maybe have a disagreement over you, something you, like guacamole. Yes. Guacamole. Well, you, well, you just throw that on right. top of the big yeah. on the pile. I guess. But so like, who doesn't like arguing about people's cultural pretensions, right? That's a, sure. that's like a fun one. It's fine. We can all do it somebody hates the wrong kind of music, whatever. 
But the second one was gender ideology, which to him followed naturally from hating oysters. Um, and gender ideology, I guess, is, you know, is LGBTQ rights, um, is trans rights, is that kind of thing. And obviously a hot button issue in, you know, between uh, conservatives and, and whoever, uh, uh, you know, and the rest of us. Um, and then um, gender freedoms and then civil rights. So he didn't say CRT or some like other cold word. He just said civil rights are next. After civil rights, human rights. And finally, humanity itself. So the weird line that you're drawing, I mean, you, you guys don't, aren't laughing as much as you were at the guacamole thing. Um, uh, you know, the weird line where like, um, what are we talking about? Like, there, like most of us agree with something like the Equality Clause, very radical in its time, and yet very, very difficult to imagine America without one human, one vote, without, uh, without you know, jury duty, without taxation, without the collective, without us like just putting our dough together and um, trying to do things that lift, you know, the least of us. Um, it just, uh, you know, there was I was reading Naomi Klein recently, and she said in the pandemic after years of neoliberalism, after forever of thinking that like Elon Musk has some opinion because he has that this many beads and monopoly money. It's just crazy. Like how we came away with the idea that like pe rich people have something really, really important to say to us. I don't know. I don't know. But after all that, Naomi Klein, who's very much on the left, pointed out that during the pandemic, it was suddenly we have to care about each other again? This is weird. Like, we have to cheer for essential workers who we, like, just never gave one thought to. Yeah. And we have to care about infecting the elderly and the immunocompromised. And, um, you know, I was thinking, yeah, that was sort of crazy. It was like we had been trained not to care. And, it, you know, especially in the Obama era, and then things fell apart, like, in, in Trump times. But just you know, with the idea that this like project came down to like money and thread count and stuff. And then suddenly it didn't in the pandemic. And, you know, the horrible truth that we're all equal, if not in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of a virus that devours our lungs hmm. and that we had to work together. Yeah, well, and the we... idea that that, sorry, and then that that became divisive, right? Like, mm -hmm. and then we have like sharks and jets around masks and ivermectin and whatever else. We just like went down all these crazy roads. So as soon as I got the vaccine, I went to Dublin and um, I was talking to someone about why there hadn't been mask arguments in, in Ireland, even though, well, anyway. And uh, this guy, I, don't, I have no idea his politics. He said, what, the masks? Oh, we did it for the grannies. <laughs> and I was like, that's right. We did it for the grannies. We did it for the grannies. What was the big deal here? Mm -hmm. Like everyone likes their granny. Mm -hmm. And like just th this had nothing to do with race or politics or anything. And yet it seemed to have everything to do with it. Yeah. And so one of the things is we are not polarized around the fact that like we should, given a choice, try to protect the grannies, right? Mm -hmm. We should, we mostly sign on f to the idea that all humans are created equal. But then I worry that this idea of polarization comes up to imagine we're all divided around avocados and there are people sitting and saying, you're terrible because you have foie gras or because you color your hair, you don't color your hair. You know, the, like, those, like, they're super fun and they like, belong in uh, you know, novels and teen romances and whatever else, like all the um, little cultural stuff. And you know, my, I think I mentioned my daughter's a punk yesterday and she like... I'm going to ask you to say all of this over again, by the way. Oh, okay. Oops. <laughs> but she wears all the like black flag, like she just likes to wear punk things all over. And each badge says something really specific about the kind of person, you know, that they are, including an anarchy, whatever. And, um, and uh, you know, I feel like in some ways that's what the polarization is around. It's just mm. like... It's a Lakers and Celtics day again, you know. The jerseys we're wearing. The jerseys, the like, yeah, exactly. And just sharks and jets and who has tattoo on what side yeah. and whatever. And yeah. I mean, literally when it came down to red hats, mm -hmm. I was like, this is like some just preposterous stuff that belongs in some novel from, you know, some pop mm -hmm. novel from the 60s or something. So it's just like, and then some people walked around with red hats and they were considered to be worse or whatever. And mm -hmm. then other people 
had foie gras and they were considered to be pretentious or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And that is what I see as like the general take on polarization. Mm -hmm. if, if you didn't have a guided conversation like the one you're describing, mm -hmm. you might just sit down and hash out you know, Lakers and Celtics or Hanover High versus <laughs> Lebanon High School or whatever. That this could happen naturally. Is that, is that sort, I of, think sort that of the idea? I think the backdrop of like, can we just get back to like, we're in a democracy. Democracy mm -hmm. is the worst system except for all the others. Mm -hmm. And we roughly believe that all humans are created equal and we're mm -hmm. trying to move toward greater and greater equality and yeah. like, what are you talking about? Because pres presumably we still agree on the fundamentals. It seems like, and right. And then just like, how did someone get so off their like meds that they're suddenly like all Muslims are like somehow connected to ISIS. It's just like, mm. right. And, and the thing that did that is the thing responsible for the polarization. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I think it's probably certain media forces and certain yeah. internet precincts. Yeah, so let me, um, let me try and respond to that in a way that sort of anchors an overall analysis of polarization with a recognition of the sort of, the starting point of consensus that I think still does largely hold um, in America. And um, I, I do think it lies where you're pointing. So you, you mentioned the, the Equality Clause, Declaration of Independence, but you know about the most frequently quoted lines from American history are from the Declaration, Thomas Jefferson. You know, um, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think that those phrases still poll fairly high. Um, <laughs> Do they of, really poll them sometimes? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> it would actually yeah. be, but it would be, probably be worthwhile. Right. It would be too. like, are you down or like on that five scale? Like, yeah, like strongly agree. You guys have been a little, <laughs> little iffy about it. But the truth is, though, is that you do have dissenters uh, from from that. Um, there, there are a couple. There are a couple things here. I mean, on the one hand, I think that you know the idea that we're equal, that we should have equal rights and opportunity, is something that most Americans can get behind. And also, not even you know, just just kind of just generically reflective of that. I think that most Americans are still actually able to talk to their neighbors. I think most Americans are still actually able to talk to their colleagues and coworkers and cousins. I think most Americans um, are still able to share space with people who vote differently than they do. But um, the trend lines, I think, have accelerated rapidly in the wrong direction. And um, that's evidenced by a whole lot of things um, that I don't even think we really need to get into too much. I mean, we could talk about the fact that, you know, it used to be the case that majority of Americans lived in counties that were sort of 50, 50, 40, 60 split between the parties. Now majority of Americans live in counties that are 70, 30, 80, 20 split because we are more and more comfortable living with people who think like us and vote like us, you know. Uh, we could talk about, you know, polarization between the parties and the level of governments. Uh, there's plenty of polling to show that whereas in the 1950s and 60s, you had high percentages of Americans when it came to partisan polarization who were utterly unconcerned if their son or daughter married a Republican or a Democrat, but who were very concerned if their son or daughter married somebody of a different race or a Protestant or a Catholic for that matter. Now all of that is completely flipped mm -hmm. upside down. You have major percentages of Americans um, who do not like the idea of marrying outside of your party, interestingly enough. And so... You know, there's, there's plenty of data to show that attitudes have shifted. But I think that the thing to be highlighted here, there are two things. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, I think that there are natural, what I would you know, think of sort of natural organic forces in the flow of American society, in the flow of American history, that we're always going to make this period in our history one in which we had difficult divisions and differences between us that were always going to require some real democratic patience to begin to overcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
There are a number of reasons for that. One of them, uh, one very key one, is the increasing uh, diversity of America, demographically speaking. Um, particularly starting in the, 19, in the 1960s you know, with immigration, but also over time, you know, gay rights movement and LGBTQ movement uh, that ultimately made it safer and safer for people to come forward with different identities, different ways of talking about sexuality and gender. Uh, of course, the suffrage movement, women's rights movement uh, that became more and more powerful in American society. And part of what that meant in all of those cases was not just a horizontal sort of diversification of the body politic, where we are less and less a majority white nation, less and less a patriarchal sort of society, so to speak, um, demographically, but also a vertical integration, a vertical sort of diversity, where suddenly you have people of differing, differing life experiences, differing ethnicities and cultures, bringing different narratives of American life and history and politics into our institutions, into our corporate boardrooms, into our college campuses, obviously into the political parties, into government and so forth. And so, you know, the 1619 project would be sort of a good example of that, you know, a way of looking at and analyzing American history that sort of directly sort of collides with traditional ways of talking about the country in certain, in certain, uh, in certain respects. And in the context of that reality and a reality that many Americans of traditional uh, sort of philosophical and cultural orientations, traditionally conservative religious Americans, rural Americans, I mean, you could say white Americans, but, but even more particularly uh, folks in the South and the rural South and Appalachia found themselves over time being disconnected from and disenchanted with the cultural mainstream of American life in a way that culturally polarized them even along geographic lines. And so this is something that Barack Obama writes about in The Audacity of Hope. He talks about the sort of liberal educated conceit way back in the 1960s, which said that religion is on the way out in America, when really, in a rough paraphrasing of Obama's words, um, conservative religious America was thriving just in a way that was not interacting with the, mm -hmm. with the rest of America. You know, you had the proliferation of evangelical radio shows and publications. Um, soon the moral majority would rise up. But before that point came, uh, in Obama's words, uh, conservative religious America was ignoring the mainstream just as surely as they were being ignored by it, right? And so, you know, these, this, this divide in our culture uh, as American society becomes more diverse in all of these different ways was always going to lead to collisions. But that finds itself being sort of artificially exacerbated, I think, by the proliferation of media outlets uh, that, whether you talk about talk radio or the partisan cable news networks, uh, have a business model that's sort of rooted in polarizing the discussion uh, for the sake of ratings. Uh, in polarizing the discussion, they feed into a new business model that the political parties have, whereas what used to be big tent parties that had conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans now became parties that were seeking to sort of carve out voter bases by explicitly owning the conservative vote, explicitly owning the progressive vote. You have a way in which I think media tends to polarize and radicalize even smaller percentages of Americans, but that then go on to be the driving forces sort of selecting through the primary process the members of Congress that we send to govern us who have no incentive to govern across the aisle because really they are elected by 10% of their voters in a primary election uh, where their support was drawn by appealing to people who were motivated not by consensus building policy but through culture war issues, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have this big labyrinth of bad incentives interacting with technology and eventually social media in a way that takes what was already going to be complicated social dynamics in American life and you put it through this machine that, that amplifies that, right? That turbocharges the engine of division in American life. And so in Braver Angels, what we're trying to do is plug people back into relationships of community with each other, but give them the tools to sort of create a virtuous cycle to counter the cycle of toxicity that exists in American mm -hmm. life. And so it's not just that we have these workshops where we bring people together to have empathetic conversations. It's that in having these empathetic conversations, people build relationships that allow them to build communities that allow them in turn to organize on their college campuses, which then allows students 
to be able to have tools that allow them to, when they move on from the college experience, take those tools back with them into a local community where suddenly they're able to organize cross-generationally. The work that they do in local community is then captured in our podcasts and our newsletters, amplified in local media and in national media where we can manage to get attention from the CNNs and the Fox Newses of the world. Mm -hmm. And what we begin to do is to create a cycle of relationship building that essentially links um, sort of empathetic discourse that happens in community, to campus, to community, to government, in a way that hopefully begins to create a selection pressure for a different type of politics from the demand level up, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense, right? You have to do it that way, because polarization is not just one thing. It's an interrelationship of many different things. And so we have to create positive interrelationships that can begin to reverse those, those patterns. Um, but you can't do it unless you understand some of the reasons why people are polarized in the first place. And it does have its roots in real divisions that are there between the American people that are not quite papered over just by making reference to the Declaration of Independence, um, as much as some of our politicians would like to, would like to, 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 think, to think otherwise, as much as you and me might like to think mm -hmm. otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have to rediscover deeper things that we have in common um, because each side, whether it's Yoram Hazoni on sort of the national conservative right saying that, you know, America is not really a pluralist nation like it says in the Declaration of Independence, or Nicole Hannah-Jones uh, who said that the ideals of our nation were false at their founding, mm -hmm. granted that through the civil rights movement and the efforts of black Americans, she thinks we're closer to that than we started. But people on the left and the right uh, have reasons to feel like America's founding ideals themselves fail us, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to be able to understand that if we're going to be able to create the space for them to come back together in conversation and community, ideally. Um, I think by uh, making reference to just the Equality Clause, or I think we said earlier, some kind of very, very light humanist statement, like there is something special about human beings. I mean, the, this conversation comes up with AI a lot now. Mm. <clears throat> I think what I mean to say is that and I think, I think our current president has made this very clear, that politics is just not as exciting and the work of democracy shouldn't be as um, hyper-arousing as mm -hmm. it's been over the last six years. It's just, I mean, it's a long time now, but I think Calvin Coolidge, when he was elected, he said, I don't know if you remember this, but I mean, remember reading about this. Um, you may be not old enough to remember Calvin Coolidge. Um, uh, um, he said, I don't remember uh, him directly. He said, the American people want a solemn ass, and that's what I intend to be, okay. right? So it was like, who do you want to he be? He wasn't trying to be hyper-arousing. He was he not was trying to be hyper-arousing, solemn ass. Right. And, um, and, and Dwight Eisenhower, I was looking into the founding of Camp David, and Eisenhower, so like, you know, a modern era American president said, we need to create a place where like men can play horseshoes and darts and you know snowshoeing and mosquitoes and citronella candles or whatever all those things they do at Camp David because the work of being president is so much drudgery it was just like it, it just like it, it it shouldn't be like a great job like mm -hmm. being Elon Musk or being you know the star of The Apprentice mm -hmm. and um, and it shouldn't require I mean I don't know how much um, how much cable news you've done, but I used to be on MSNBC regularly, and at some point I, you know, so my hit would be like five minutes, mm -hmm. um, but I'd have to show up an hour and a half earlier. Why? Because that's when I would be getting my hair and makeup done. And at some point, when it was like, walk to your seat and you're gonna be talking about this, I was like, if you're spending most of the time of your work in hair and makeup, you're doing show business. Like, there's <laughs> right. no question that, like, the five minutes, and I also would it be like- It is show business. It's exactly without, without, show business, right? Doubt, right? And and the president, the other, the former president, and maybe even Obama spent way too much time in hair and makeup. Like, this, this should be, like, just, I mean, you know, my candidate, Hillary Clinton, was just, like, a tirelessly hard worker. And I know that they're supposed to be, I, I know that, you know, to some extent, presidents are meant to inspire us. And, you know, our current president gives one, um, a, to me, quite inspiring press conference every day. And, you know, one tunes into them, but there they are. And, 
you know, but the idea that they're supposed to be Braveheart or they're supposed to um, be a pugilist or supposed to stand in the space, they can't satisfy um, the part of us that wants um, a robust cultural experience, mm -hmm. a, an experience that includes music. And ex like, I mean, and I want to hear more about Braver Angels there. Yeah. We're asking way too much of our politics, and we, you know, we put a reality. But we do, we do want politics to be to be entertaining because we have become such an entertainment-oriented sort of right. sort of culture. Right, exactly. Right? And it's part of a consequence of existing in the technological landscape that we that we that we live in. Mm -hmm. Right um, now, look. Politics was always something that kind of lent itself to a performative kind of way of being, you know? Um, it's, it's, it's. Well, it's, we should draw not, a distinction between politics and governing, but right? There's always been, well, that's the thing. These are yeah. two distinctly different yes. skill sets, right? right? And it's, so it's Calvary, very hard to get yeah. somebody who has both of those because in a way it's right. almost the opposite kind of personality type, right? Somebody who's good at politics is good at speaking with people, right. patting people on the back, making jokes, you know, quick flashy smiles. Um, you know, I, I I did my best with it. I didn't quite I didn't quite make I didn't quite make a living of it myself. But you know, I grew up an artist and an entertainer. You yeah, know, I grew up in a family right. of jazz musicians and singers and hip hop artists and and whatnot. The skills I learned on the bandstand served me well in politics. Um, but you know, the actual work of studying right. policy, um, being able to understand the mechanisms of society yeah. in a way that creates consensus around reasonable solutions. Right. Totally different. Totally different. Yes, you know? right. And th but I, I guess my point is that the conversation that people are having and arguing about is really often about something so rarefied that it's like it's something in park politics and marketing maybe area veering into culture. So that, for instance, I mean, I'm a broken record on this, but um, you know, the Biden administration has thirty-seven thousand um, infrastructure uh, projects. It, it, underway or completed across 50 states. Um, and you, right around here is just improving um, the electric grid and you know there are bridges. Anyway, in what you know is the bipartisan um, infrastructure bill. Every time I bring this up with anyone of any politics, what mm -hmm. they say is like, but why is Biden stumble when he talks or whatever? Mm -hmm. Are we all like just political consultants who want to sp spend our time saying he should wear earth tones or whatever? Like, okay, right. You probably have great ideas about how someone should run for president and what they should you, say you in know, their speeches. How, you know, I think, but isn't it somewhat interesting? 37,000 some, infrastructure projects is enormous. Might, somebody might want to correct me on my history, but if I'm not mistaken, part of how Abraham Lincoln managed to get reelected in 1864 uh, was by was by advertising the fact that America was going to have its first Thanksgiving celebrations, right? Where you're going to have, I think, you know, actual sort of like parties and gatherings and yeah. free food and so forth, you know, across across the Union on a date that just happened to fall right after the re-election, uh, right after the election, <laughs> right? Right. Um, and this was in the middle of the Civil War. Yeah. But bread and circuses, you know, take the old Roman phrase, uh, still was something that motivated, that at least Lincoln thought, right. you know, might be the difference maker in a moment where you had an actual war to talk about. I mean, the so I, I think kind this, of always I think the strategy a, you know, game of people that, winning you know? or losing elections or marketing and not marketing mm -hmm. are totally fascinating and worth mm -hmm. talking around, uh, talking about at the dinner table. But I'm not sure that the thing that people are arguing about when they argue about uh, you know, small turns of phrase or like little, like basically the foie gras and oysters and, mm. and lattes and, you know, red hats of the thing, that they're arguing substantially about politics. Like, for instance. I'm not sure those are the main things that people are arguing. Well, let me give you this one example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine like a whole spectrum of approaches to immigration, so from like shoot on site, close the borders, you know, giant walls, guns, bombs, whatever, landmines, mm -hmm. all the way to open borders, you know, yeah. let everyone come in, make everyone a citizen on the first night they're here. You would be like, oh, there are all these interesting arguments you could have along the way. And you and I could have those discussions. Mm -hmm. You lean a little farther right than I do. And maybe you have like really cool ideas about this and that. And, um, and it would be a great discussion. But the conversation about immigration right now is, hey, Ron DeSantis, what do you think about immigration? Mm. I hate Martha's Vineyard. Mm. What? Sure. 
How do you possibly explain how we got so up our asses that we're like fighting about weird things that happened because like Martha's, I mean, yeah. how do you possibly I, I, explain I see, to I Venezuelan see. immigrants how they ended up in Chilmark mm -hmm. uh, on a small island off Massachusetts? Well, you explain it because this politician was mad at this politician because he went to Yale with this person and blah, blah, blah. Let's talk about Martha's Vineyard, mm -hmm. how snobs they are there, the foie gras there, whatever. Right. And like, are we talking about governing or but, what? But are see, we talking I, about immigration or I, I think though, I think Virginia, that the way the way you exp the way you, you explain it, the way I would explain it, yeah, is to say that these political things that seem like gimmicks of politicians, and I, and I think that not only was that sort of a gimmicky move, but it was sort of a heartless. For, I mean, for me, I I was very I was very bothered by sort of you know just using human beings as political props and in in the way that DeSantis did. But having said that, though, this is just my personal. Opinion. Having said that, though, the reason that had resonance was not just because it was performative. DeSantis did that in a context where most conservatives, or at least a great many conservatives, feel not that Democrats have bad policy ideas when it comes to border, uh, when it comes to the border, when it comes to immigration, but that Democrats are at least the leading uh, figures of the Democratic Party. Uh, and the liberal sort of establishment do not actually have a desire to secure the border at all because they do not have a desire to protect America as a nation at all because they do not actually believe in America. That is the chain of observations that is deeply and emotionally felt, right or wrong, but that is deeply and emotionally felt by people in conservative America. And so DeSantis in doing what he did was really sort of um, theatricizing the, um, the hypocrisy of that, the perceived hypocrisy of that, by saying that I can prove that they don't really care about the immigrants because if they did, they would take care of them when I send them to Martha's Vineyard and they're not really trying to do that, right? This proves our suspicions about the motivations of these people on the other side. And so actually, you know, what seems like a trivial sort of thing on the surface is something that's symbolic of much deeper anxieties and antipathies that are felt by people, in this case, on the conservative end, about the very sort of motivations of people on the other side. And this is why, for me, you know, beyond the Declaration of Independence and this, that, or the other, the thing that we have to get back to is what Martin Luther King Jr. taught um, in the nonviolent movement through his philosophy of nonviolence, the idea that certain divides cannot be crossed by anything more than, than a commitment to agape love, to a spirit of goodwill, which essentially says that I recognize the humanity in people who disagree with me and I will hold myself to a standard of conduct in the way I engage them because I'm seeking to speak to their conscience and rehabilitate our relationships so we can share community together. Mm -hmm. King didn't want to look at anybody as being irredeemable, but it is in vogue right now in our politics to seemingly look at everybody as irredeemable who doesn't agree with what it is we're saying. I'm exaggerating, mm -hmm. but that is the flavor uh, of the discourse that has risen to the top in terms mm -hmm. of the way politicians and pundits alike uh, talk, um, exercise uh, you know, the discourse of democracy in America today. And so I think only something as fundamental as love, you know, beyond all the sorts of strategies we're building at Braver Angels, maybe at the root of that, mm. is sufficient to sort of transform the, the spirit of a political conversation that otherwise I think is fairly broken, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's my, that's my sum total of it. And, uh, and I also noticed that we're at 13 minutes. I think we want to make make room for questions. Yes, uh, I think that's um, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, right here. And is there a microphone that's supposed to be going around to? Okay. Hi, I have a patient who is very involved in Braver Angels. Oh. And um, that's wonderful. A patient? Yeah, I'm a dentist. Oh, okay. okay. Uh -huh. And so I get to spend lots of time. I was going to say, are you a psychologist? Yeah, yeah, I thought yeah, you were going to tell no. me, like, you know, no, but you guys have ruined this person. I get to, I, I'm not, like, personally connect, connected to our world, but I do get to spend lots and lots of time with her. And so we mm. chat, 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 chat. So I've heard so much about this organization. Mm. So much good. Thank you. And I, and I'm, I'm not very confrontational. Mm -hmm. And I tried to imagine myself, she's tried to get me to come to these meetings a hundred times. <laughs> and I just can't imagine how I would be in that environment. Mm, yeah. 
sometimes because I, I am imagining how the other side would be. Mm, sure. Right. And so I, I wonder, what talk to me about the kind of people mm -hmm. that engage in these dialogues. It seems like it would take a lot of courage and, I don't know, something different than I feel like mm -hmm. I have. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, there are a couple of people in this room you can talk to a bit more about that. Uh, my new friend, uh, Mary Kay, who's the co-chair uh, of our Burlington Alliance. Is that correct? Yeah. Say that again? Shinton and Cali. Shinton and Cali. Okay. Yes. There you go. The there county. you go. There you go. Uh, Co-chair of one of our local alliances here, and Elizabeth Dahl, who heads our Braver Politics program, which is really about workshops in the context of actual political campaigns that candidates and electives participate in. But to your question, um, we really it, it will vary quite a bit according to ideology. But our our one fundamental rule. I mean, there's a series of you know ground rules that they go into place here. But but the fundamental thing that I would like to think. Any and everybody participating in a Braver Angels workshop or debate has in common is that they are showing up in good faith and a mind that is open, if not to being fully persuaded on the level of politics, at least to recognizing the fact that maybe just maybe the people on the other side actually have good intentions, that they're actually decent human beings, right? Uh, the spirit of our containers, of the work that we do, of the programs that we design uh, is meant to hold the space for empathy and goodwill while also not you know, sparing us from the reality that there will be discomfort. And there often is in the work that we do. Right? I mean, there's no way, there's simply no way around that. But with discomfort also comes growth and sometimes the opportunity uh, to generate real and meaningful relationships. You heard me talk about Greg and Kuyar earlier, but there's just countless, countless examples, you know? So if you ever do show up, and I hope you do, uh, you know, expect to maybe be a little uncomfortable here or there, but also expect that, you know, much more likely than not, you're gonna meet uh, beautiful and amazing people, you know, uh, who are showing up uh, precisely because uh, they wanna see the beauty and the goodness in you. Yeah. Oh, uh, can someone mics? I can yell. That's fine. That, no, we, they love mics here. <laughs> I don't mind you yelling, but we're also doing a stream here. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, th I think this is a great conversation to be a part of. I'm not a particularly political person, so it's great to really take it in in this way. Um, I feel like a lot of what I heard today is stuff around how this these conversations and this kind of, of creative discourse where we're creating empathy and shared space is really well suited for educational settings and, and maybe post-secondary the academic space. What about in workspaces where these are conversations where critical thinking is not really at the forefront or openness to new ideologies or thought processes is not really prevalent, right? You're going to school, you're there to learn in the first place there in and of itself. Work environments, you know, some folks come through literally to pick up a check, go home, get back to their families. And I feel like part of the narrative that I've heard in the past few years, particularly in these last two elections, certainly the Black Lives Matter movement, organizations have been split yeah. almost down the middle, unbeknownst to them in a way that never they had to kind of experience before. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts, ideas about... Is it a Braver Angels sessions that we do in a corporate space to create common ground for how you keep an organization connected and moving towards these goals and outcomes that they have, even though they do not hold a space or particularly a responsibility towards the mediation of different mm -hmm. political ideas or anything in that space? I think I'm just curious to hear about some thoughts or ideas around how do we, in an environment that's not centered on open-mindedness or mm -hmm. the natural curiosity for learning, where you don't necessarily have to show up in every way that you want to, but in some of these really political, really politically charged spaces, yeah. now you gotta deal with somebody who, in some work environments, your life yeah. is in the hands of somebody who all of a sudden completely unbeknownst to you, you hate Black Lives Matter or you hate the Democrats or you hate the Republicans and maybe this is the first time you've seen Bob in this light and you've been working with him for 12 years. What the hell do you do with it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> Poor Bob. Yeah. Just um, <laughs> what? yeah no, right. <laughs> no, 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 I appreciate that. Um, yeah, Virginia, I'll, I'll say something to that quickly and, and I know you got something to uh, the bis the corporate sector the business sector is absolutely a major part of this equation and you're absolutely right the polarization is as rampant in corporate America as anywhere else um, we do have some corporate 
work that we've done. I would say it's a lane of Brave Rangers work that is still kind of being developed, but I've spoken to General Mills and Target and Lucasfilms and you know, a pretty wide range of American corporations who are dealing with exactly the sorts of issues that you're, that you're uh, bringing up. Um, you know, part of, I, I do think that uh, we will come to the point to where we have uh, workshops and containers that are very specifically sort of calibrated for the corporate and the business environment. I think that part of the context of polarization in corporate America and elsewhere um, you know, it has to do with the fact that there are pre-existing attempts at creating relationships and understanding through the diversity, <laughs> equity, and inclusion industry um, that um, vary, quite frankly, in terms of the approach, in terms of the way different folks go about it. There are many different ways to uh, practice DEI work. Um, and sometimes it's somewhat similar to what we do and other times it's different. I tend to think that if you're interested in creating cohesion among people in a corporate setting or an institutional setting or otherwise, it's very important that everybody be able to be fully heard. Sometimes in the way some of these containers are designed, because we have a recognition of the fact that America historically and contemporaneously, at least <coughs> arguably, I would argue, is one in which opportunity is, all, is oftentimes circumscribed according to lines of identity, whether it be race or gender or what have you, there can be a desire to structure interaction in ways that prioritize one group over another. But even if history and the larger context of societal realities are what they are, you still in interpersonal relationships have to allow people to show up in equal footing in the context of a conversation. And so uh, this is a whole subject unto itself, right? Sort of comparing methodologies and so forth. But oftentimes, you know, when I do consult with corporations and so forth, I'm, I'm being brought into these conversations in the context of, hey, we're trying this, we're trying that, but we're still having these problems and those problems, and this is getting better while that's getting worse. And so it's its own landscape, but you're absolutely right that's, that it really matters. Yeah. That's right, too. Um, uh, two things. One is that um, Robert's Rules of Order, you know, the like motion seconded, like, you know, that, that way of proceeding in a meeting sort of dated now, but um, is an artifact of the um, pre-Civil War period. It was a Methodist church in Connecticut. I don't know if you know about this, that it had to put a break on how passionate people were in conversations <laughs> about slavery and abolition. Okay. Um, and so it is in hot times like this mm -hmm. that we come up with ways of relating, just like mm -hmm. guardrails for talking. Right. And I think one of the great innovations of Braver Angels is just like an actual, you know, we like just need referees we need a break on how avid we are to go into it sometimes you just are you know they say dialing pain like you're just like looking with a chip on your shoulder to be like oh say that sexist thing again so i can be mad you know mm -hmm. and like those are our less brave angels those are our more <laughs> cowardly more you know darker angels mm -hmm. um that just are spoiling for a fight sure. and um you know this robert's rules which i actually still find a for a sort of beautiful way of organizing a meeting, mm -hmm. um, you know, when some chunk of the language is reserved for like uh, the chair recognizes the gentle lady from Wisconsin, like that kind of stuff, you know, just just bureaucratic speak <clears throat> reminds us that like this is a civil setting. We're not suddenly going to, you know, start um, go off the rails. Yeah. This isn't like even if you're finding yourself getting heated, there are like a lot of mechanisms of civilization that keep us all from you know, coming to blows over these arguments. Mm -hmm. And I, it's interesting, I think, that something like Robert's Rules, which is used in many business places still, comes to, like, as a way of mediating disputes in times of especially as passionate uh, political discourse. Mm -hmm. And the same is true, I think, with the method of talking at Braver Angels. So that's one thing. The other just quick thing about a workplace so I'm a big believer in campaigns, not movements. And what I mean by that is movements usually have all kinds of ideology attached to them. You're trying to receive, like reach something like the you know, apotheosis of the worker. And you never know when you're going to get there. And you're usually policing people who are doing it wrong on the way. Like, are you with the movement, not with the movement? A campaign is something with like, I don't know, what do you all say, KPIs? Like you, you have like you have some, a deliverable, right, yeah. at different places. So like, you know, if the idea is that, um, you know, you want to get 200 more beds for um, unhoused people um, in Burlington, we could all divide up. We could have no, do not have to have one conversation about 
our individual responsibility to the poor or what the role of the homeless is or whatever, some of us could just start working on the mattresses and some of us could work on the, on the bedding and some of us could work on... The, and campaigns, it is almost... Um, impossible once people get involved in a campaign that they suddenly want to hash out like is the world round or you know I, I, I worked with someone who didn't believe in the moon landing oh, so like this is an interesting moment and he was my uh, he, I, I was making a podcast and he did he was one of the sound engineers and at some point we were just like sitting around and he was like I don't think the moon landing happened and I just had that moment where you're like I think of it as like a Greyhound bus moment because like sometime in the 90s, someone on a Greyhound bus was like, I think Proct Procter and Gamble is the sign of the beast. Okay. And I was just like, I don't want to have this conversation. <laughs> Can that just end? Um, and so it, anyway, we briefly talked about the moon landing. He felt as though the moon landing had been staged to something, the Cold War or something, something. It made sort of sense. And then I was like, let's make the podcast. Let's just go back to making the podcast. And we just, it turned out that it was, it didn't matter. It's like, it didn't, it didn't matter if someone believes the Bohr model of atoms and someone else is, has some relativist idea of atoms. At some point, like it just, we, you need only roughly to agree on the tasks that need to be accomplished. And these things, whether or not you believe in the moon landing or flat earth or the vaccine or whatever, don't actually need to color getting work done. And it is so nice to drop those things, you know? I mean, sure there are people, and this to go to, uh, to marriage counseling, there's so many things that you just actually disagree with with your spouse, ultimately. It's not as though you've resolved all of them and you come to some perfect consensus. Oh, yeah, just... yeah, no, and there, there's no way in which 100% reconciliation on every point of disagreement is the standard of success, right? It, it's getting to the point where we can live with the disagreement. We can live with right? the disagreement, exactly. That, 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 think... makes it, that makes it work. I think we're at about yeah. 10 seconds here, Virginia. Right? Yeah, that's right. Anyway, so we're gonna have to do this wait, again. one more, we got 10 seconds. Can someone bring a mic over? Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I know we're running out of time. Um, quick question. You talk about bringing people together. There's kind of a, an assumption of empathy, which is great. Do you ever feel like you're addressing the portion of the audience that least needs it? Mm -hmm. Sure. Because yeah. the people who really are pulling at the furthest extremes are the mm -hmm. ones who don't have empathy and mm -hmm. who tend to scapegoat. And that kind of, I'm going to not, this is not really a question, but my, my it, isn't this a psychological phenomenon? And aren't mm -hmm. we dealing with some? fairly upset human beings and that isn't isn't there self selection. Self selection mm -hmm. and isn't yeah. the isn't the core problem is that we've got a lot of people who are very afraid and who are very upset and who are very stressed out and mm -hmm. that leads them to be less empathic and that leads them to scapegoat and it leads them to embrace ideas not because they're true in any meaningful yeah. sense of the word, but because they satisfy various unhealthy psychological needs. Yeah. Um, two two statements uh, as concise as I can make them in the interests of, of time. Um, one, you do have uh, particularly polarized people coming into our spaces. Yes, it, it has a natural appeal to people who already see the problem, right? But those people frequently bring their neighbors or their spouses or their cousins or their grandparents. Who's, they look at them and say, you need this, right? Mm. And so, you know, um, there are varying ways in which folks who are further out on the, on the edges do find their way into our spaces. But the other thing I would say simply is that galvanizing those people among us who, you know, may be a little bit more moderate temperamentally, but are still deeply, deeply struggling with these divisions mm -hmm. is a way of showing people that it is possible for us to organize in a way that is collaborative, that is goodwill based, and that can stabilize the acrimony uh, that is tearing, tearing our politics apart. Uh, in a manner that tells a different story to everybody, right, left, and center, no matter how polarized you might be, that something better is possible in America. And so it's not a waste of time even to bring people together who are not all the way off the cliff, but who are still struggling and suffering mm -hmm. uh, to be able to build something better than the status quo. I think that's, that's a great answer. Um, we're going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. This is great. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.